doctors. So I'm going to get started. You know that Dr. Kat, that Dr. Katz or Joshua Katz, I should call him, is you somehow you accepted this guy. You know, we, we really have I know. We have I know. reservations. We'll talk afterwards offline. Yes, I you was, uh, yeah, we, yeah. So he's, <laughs> he's a big part of brain turns. He's uh, I know he is. We've communicated many times. I didn't put the two and two together, actually, <laughs> until after it was all done. I'm like, that, Josh Cash? He's yeah. the celebrity, celebrity brain yeah. turn guy. Yeah, it's great. All right, so the ultimate uh, should we just get yeah. started then? Yep, it's all you. Before all right, well, Dr. Wallenberg over here in two minutes. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about uh, how to apply to medical school. And once you get in, if you get uh, decide to apply to the Zucker School of Medicine, what the first couple of years of medical school is, is like. So most of this talk will be a, uh, about applying to medical school. Um, and Dr. Waldenberg uh, will take over once she joins us. So Dr. Waldenberg is our Associate Dean of Admissions and I'm uh, Joanne Willey and I'm the chair of the uh, Department of Science Education, which is the department that, it's, that oversees all the full-time medical educators at the School of Medicine. So this is PhDs and MDs and MD-PhDs. Okay, so you want to be a doctor. Whoops. So we're gonna start out with uh, what was the first medical school in the United States. So I wanna open the chat here. So if you guys wanna, I can't see the chat. Can somebody watch the chat for me? Yeah, I can watch it. We've got it for you, you're okay. Okay, so are we getting any guesses? What was the first medical school in the United Penn. States? Everyone's saying Penn. It was Penn, I went there, Penn, it's Penn. All right, it was Penn, <laughs> all right. Well, it turns <laughs> out that Dr. Langer is not the only person who went to Penn. So Dr. Waldenberg <laughs> is also a graduate of Penn Medicine and I actually went there as an undergraduate. So we've got a lot of Penn people here. Oh my God. Okay, all right, here's a harder one. Who was the first woman graduate of an American medical school? We have an Elizabeth Blackwell. Blackwell. We've got Any a go other? Quakers. <laughs> Any other guesses? Mary Elizabeth. Walker. All right, Elizabeth Back Blackwell. Very yeah. good. Geneva Medical College in New York. So there she is with her very uh, Queen Victoria looking uh, attire. Okay, so Here's a nice infographic that shows sort of uh, what applying to medical school involves. So um, I assume that uh, many of the students watching are applying to medical school or have applied to medical school. So uh, it's, a, it's kind of a big business. Um, AMCAS is the platform on which all of this uh, it, it occurs. Um, and you can see that they handle quite a number of documents. Um, this is probably the number that most people wanna focus on, how many applicants and how many enroll. Um, so you can see that the applicant GPA is lower than the average enrollee GPA. Interestingly, um, more women than men are going to medical school these days. So um, that would make Elizabeth Blackwell very happy. Um, I think, uh, Something that's not on here is the cost of applying to medical school, which uh, in the virtual COVID world has uh, dropped considerably since all the interview processes have gone virtual. So um, it, enroll, uh, applications to medical school are up this year. And there's two ideas as to why. One is that gap year opportunities have shrunk. And also it's, um, it's since you don't have to actually go and visit all the places you get invited to, it's a bit cheaper. So if you guys, maybe you guys can tell us why you think um, med school applications are up this year. Sorry, Dr. Willie, this is this year's numbers? Uh, this is 2019. So this would have been last year's numbers. Right? This year is still a work in progress. So we don't actually have those those numbers yet. I will tell you, you know, we had the Brain Turns um, program was about 80% uh, female. Really? Um, yeah, which is interesting. That's... You know, we're 
we're looking at it for the, you know, whether or not it reflects kind of the future of what we're going to see in medicine in terms of a shift, further shift, I guess, in terms of applicants, but very interesting. That's super interesting. Yeah, I've been on too many NIH study sections that have had two women and 20 men. So yeah. that's- We might um, see the opposite soon. Yeah, well, or let's, if we get to parity, that would be a huge, huge yeah. uh, improvement. Okay, so, um, so I'm sort of winging this because these are these are Dr. Woldemer's slides. So um, what uh, in looking at the academic metrics, what me, uh, what are me, what meta, are medical schools actually using? So I can speak in terms of uh, being on our own uh, admissions committee that. Um, the, the metrics are gonna get you through the door. So every medical school has sort of a, a range of MCATs or at least a, a floor uh, below which they're not going to take a look at you unless you have some very, very, very specific uh, and interesting experiences or you have a specific demographic. Schools really want a, a well-balanced group of students that represent uh, diverse demographics, diverse experiences and um, a diversity of where students went to college, um, what their majors were. So we don't want everybody to be a science, you know, we don't want a whole class full of biochemistry majors. We don't want a whole class full of philosophy majors either for that matter. So um, schools are looking to mix things up and make things as diverse as, po as possible. So um, when you're applying to medical schools, one thing that you can do is you can um, you can go to the school's websites and, and figure out, uh, it's, it's not too hard, figure out what their, uh, not the applicant MCAT score is, but what the enrollee MCAT score is and sort of figure out where you um, will, will be competitive. So um, this has a lot of data on it. Um, and- Joanne, it, Joanne, can you hear me? Thank I'm you. Here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I need you to do your slides, Dr. Waldenberg, because I'm uh, okay. I, <laughs> I'm I stumbling am, through I, them. I am here. So let me um, let me get back in here. Sorry about that. I was trying to get in through my desktop, and um, it was not. Uh, my mic wasn't getting access. So um, let can I share screen, uh, Josh? Am I share screen here? Uh, I okay, just got to switch. I think uh, Dr. Willie has to unshare first, and then you'll switch. Okay. If okay. we could, that would be great. And that we can, I can take okay. over. And then, uh, Joanne, if you can even monitor the chat, that would be great yeah. while I'm talking. Okay. So if now Joanne is out, is that right? So, yeah, it's out. Okay. Am I in? Am I sharing? Yeah, you got to share. Not Am yet. I not shared yet. Hold on. Okay. Let's see. Let me get. So I'm going to answer some of these questions while you're fiddling around share with Share screen. Does study abroad okay. add to the element of uniqueness? Yes. Share. Study abroad, but what you do abroad um, is... Okay, is good, I, Rona. You're, you're good, Rona. You're okay, good. I'm shared. Okay, so now you know the answers to all these questions. Yeah, right. we were like slide four or five. I know. I'm moving, yeah, I'm moving along here. Let me get to... I'm trying to get... Here we go. Okay. We were past the infographic. Got it. Got it. I'm coming along here. The medium. Yep. I kind of stumbled through this one. That's yeah, okay. That's All right. right. So uh, let me get rid of this. Okay. We're good. So um, Joanne mentioned, and you can see that there's been a gradual increase um, in the number of in the number of applicants over the past. Uh, 10 years. And this year uh, in our school, our applicant number is actually, and I think I heard Joanne mention this as I was having my tech anxiety, uh, but um, the national is up about 19%. We're up 25%. And a lot of that uh, is potentially because of the gap year issue. Uh, our average age is dropped by a year. So our students are younger because a lot of our uh, applicants are coming straight out of college. And we are seeing that um, um, in our applicant pool. So the interesting question is, and if you look here, um, you see that in this top box, that is MCATs of 95 percentile plus and GPA plus, you see that, whoopee, I, 
got it has a life of its own sometimes. That's why I was trying to avoid the lab, laptop a little bit. But um, you see that only about 88% um, of those students get in. So why do people think that potentially students who are in a very strong metric box, why do you think they may not be getting into medical school? Okay, again, top GPAs, top MCATs. Joanne, do we have any interesting answers? Uh, let's see. Hang on. You come in so fast. Uh, geez, Louise. Not well rounded. I okay. See. Poor interviews. Okay. No story. Uh, lack of experience, lack of clinical. Um, poor personal something. No true passion. Too cookie cutter. Okay, yeah. so those are all very good answers. And one of the main ones is that interview, okay? So yeah. everybody thinks it's numbers, numbers, numbers. Numbers will help you get in the door, but ultimately the interview is incredibly important because once you are in the door and you're actually being interviewed, everybody sort of comes back to the same plane or the same footing. And therefore, you know, the interview takes on a really unique importance because law schools don't have interviews and business schools don't have interviews. The other thing uh, potentially that keeps people out of the door besides the interview are institutional actions. Some students have significant violations um, that inhibit their ability to get into medical school. And those actions can be significant when you have such a large pool of applicants, somebody will say, well, why do I bother with somebody who cheated in college or plagiarized when they were in college when I can have somebody who looks exactly the same and doesn't have those issues or those ethical breaches. So, you know, please, you know, I, I, I'm sure you're all, all the listeners are very ethically sound, but those have significant implications and just be aware of that. Okay, going forward here. Okay, so to give you an idea, uh, the average MCAT of the applied group was a 506. Um, and as Joanne referenced that um, slide with all the data, really the average MCAT of the matriculated group is somewhere around a 511, 512. So um, the applicant pool is competitive. Obviously it's differently competitive in different parts of the United States. In New York, it's highly competitive. In California, it's highly competitive. These numbers may be even significantly higher. Our median MCAT um, in our current first year class is a 517. So understand that the New York area is a very competitive area, but um, there are other areas. There are other areas of the country that are not as competitive. Um, and if you have an opportunity to uh, apply broadly, uh, it's always helpful. Um, and it, you are geographic diversity in other parts of the United States. If you are New Yorkers, if you're out of New York, uh, again, geographic diversity is a type of diversity that is also relevant uh, as far as medical schools go, uh, and especially those uh, private medical schools. Um, again, try just a little bit tech. Okay, so first year MCAT was administered. Any good answers here? Joanne, you'll tell me any good answers. 1989, 1928, 1950, 1962, 1972, 1962. We're getting a, basically somewhere in the 20th century. David Langer. Blackwell graduated. Was the there thing. you go. There yeah. you go. So somebody I think was listening last time, and it is 1928. Um, the last revision was actually after Dr. Langer and I graduated medical school, uh, which was 1991. And um, the most recent, um, as you may be aware, is uh, MCAT 2015. So new, new test, old test, and um, the new test obviously has uh, new content, and that is biochemistry and psychology and sociology, with a recognition that the social sciences are critically important for physicians as well as the uh, material sciences. Um, applied knowledge is what it's all about these days. Now, um, computers have uh, basically um, 
totally revolutionized the way we practice medicine. Facts are very easily retrievable. They don't have to necessarily come from your temporal lobe. Uh, they can come from your iPhone. So being able to take fact knowledge and apply it is critical. And that's really what the new MCAT is all about. Um, and again, what we're trying to do is assess your ability to think like a physician and to apply knowledge to solve problems, basically. Um, and that, that's really critical in um, an understanding of medicine today and the role of uh, social determinants of health and um, as that impacts healthcare as well. So all of these things basically were incorporated into the new exam. Now, allegedly, uh, starting in January, they will go back to this format for the questions. Um, I will put up a new, another slide that will show you what the MCAT looked like uh, during the COVID times, where they shortened the exams in order to allow for more examinations to take place as many of the exams were canceled. They shortened the time and they were allowed to do they were able to administer three sessions uh, in one test state. As of now, last I heard, January, they were going back to this format. Um, however, as you are all aware, COVID is happening and um, those decisions can be changed very, very quickly. I'm sorry, decision can be made to switch back to the shortened version very quickly if places are closing their exam centers, et cetera. So again, the score scale uh, potential of achieving a 528 is the top score, 472 with the median now is about a 501 actually, but uh, around the 500 range, that's the goal. So maximum in each section of 132 with uh, the mean about a 125. Okay, so here's the COVID uh, environment where they shortened the test uh, down to 48 questions a section, and that allowed for shorter exam time and allowing for actually three different administrations in one day, 6 a.m. to 12 noon, 12 noon to 6 p.m., and then 6 p.m. to 12 midnight, and God bless those night owls. I don't know how your brain is functioning at 11.30 at night, but as college students, you probably are very good at that. I think as you age, Joanne, you're probably with me on that, and even Dr. Langer can admit that, you know, <laughs> at 11.30 at night, answering multiple choice questions isn't probably, we're probably not at our best anymore. Um, just a little bit about those of you who may be considering um, osteopathic versus allopathic programs. Allopathic programs refer to MD type programs. MD is an allopathic physician. DO is the osteopathic um, route. The osteopathic route is slightly less competitive, as you can see that in terms of the average MCAT, the average GPA. Um, however, many um, DO graduates are incorporated into the MD residency programs. Um, it is, uh, there are many um, MD residency programs who will take DOs into the, their program. The opposite is not true. The DO programs generally do not take MDs into their residencies, but um, the opposite is, is true. And DO graduates can enter into the MD allopathic re residency programs. But for some students who don't get into medical school, um, the osteopathic route is a plan B, is an alternate route. And students have had success uh, and significant success. And you may know uh, a DO or see a DO. And um, I, I am aware of many that are very, very high quality physicians. So uh, a DO degree does not uh, by any means um, exclude you from uh, a medical residency program in the United States in any of the specialties. Um, and Again, there are subtle nuanced differences between the DO programs and the MD programs, but the um, education is very, very similar. And many of those who are in the DO programs will take um, the step, the MD or the National Board of Medical Examiner step exams again to qualify uh, for MD residency programs. So how many allopathic MD schools are there in the United States as of today? What do we got as some answers? 
206, 90, 165, 320, 150, 200, 188, 138, 120. Okay, so the 150 is probably the closest. Um, there are 155 um, um, schools currently uh, with, uh, f I think, 142 have full LCME accreditation. Another 13 have preliminary or provisional, and that number uh, is growing. I think actually now there may... Um, be close to one. There are maybe an additional five that have started to walk through the process as well. So the number is somewhere in the 155 to 160 range. So um, there are a few that may have been tacked on uh, since I, I put this slide up. But um, the Zucker School of Medicine was the 133rd school uh, in the line. And uh, Joanne will talk a little bit later on about our program and how by being a new school, uh, we were able to revamp the curriculum to make it much more um, applicable to practicing medicine in 2027 and beyond, which is where many of you are, are gonna end up um, applying to medical school now. Uh, so osteopathic schools, thoughts, numbers? Any good numbers in there, Joanne? Uh, 50, 60, 40. Uh, All right, the 40, 36, number is, the 40 number is good. So uh, there are about 37 uh, osteopathic schools and only two uh, schools offer both MD and DO programs and that's uh, Michigan State and UMDMJ. So uh, that's, those are the opportunities available uh, for those who may not get into medical school but want to take a plan B or an alternate route when we talk about an allopathic school versus an osteopathic school. Uh, some useful websites here. Um, all of these uh, well-known, uh, one to add is this, um, for those of you who like listening to podcasts, um, the um, admission staff at Case Western Reserve Medical School um, has put together about close to 50 podcasts. Some um, are discussions from medical school dean of admissions like myself. Um, others are tips on application processes and things like that. It's free. So for those of you who do like to um, listen to podcasts, I strongly uh, recommend that you uh, listen. Um, they did a wonderful job. And again, um, providing free resources to students um, and uh, guidance in a time where maybe access, access to the guidance counselors is limited as the college campuses are shut down. Okay, a little bit about the application itself. Um, essay, obviously critically important. We talked about the numbers, the numbers are the numbers. That I leave up to you, your MCAT, your GPA. Um, but when you're writing your essay, um, the most important thing is that first sentence. Understand that the people like myself are reading thousands of these. We got 6,400 applications this year, something like that. Uh, we're reading a lot of them. You want somebody to read yours, right? So you want to have a hook. And same thing was the case with your college essay. Um, any different lead-in sentence is uh, available to you, but you want one that's gonna capture the reader. That's probably the most important. A quotation, a story, an event, a something that we really wanna make the reader go through and look what you have to say. Um, try and be personal. I think um, that's very, very important. Um, don't use vocabulary that you're not comfortable with, um, but on the other hand, don't use cliches, okay? So um, th that's very, very important. I think a lot of people stylistically have gotten um, accustomed to using cliches. Um, when it comes to your written um, work, you should try to avoid them as much as possible. So things like when push comes to shove, you don't wanna put that something like that in your essay. Um, be careful with that. They, it, they should read well, they should uh, get your points across well, but try to avoid uh, cliche as much as possible. The other thing to avoid is the use of the word of the pronoun I, I, I. 
Okay, I talk about iitis. Okay, um, you medicine and what we do every day is so much about the other. It's about the patient. It's about the colleagues that you work with. It's about the team. So try to avoid the use of I. I decided to become a doctor because I was good in science and I was good in math and I and I and I. No good, okay? Try your best to avoid that the I's as, as much as you can. Um, some suggestions make sure your story is clear. Why did you decide to be a doctor? What is motivating you to learn more about medicine? Um, one of the things that is probably the most important thing in being a physician is resiliency. We have to, we have to be able to get over our mistakes. We have to be able to accept our failures, our limitations. So anything that you can convey that demonstrates that you have done that in the past or you have the potential to do that uh, is uh, important. The other thing is, and it says here on the bottom, and you can see about the fluctuations in your academic record. Um, one thing I would caution you, don't highlight bad grades in any discussion of your application. They are there. OK, you don't necessarily want to highlight them and bring attention to them and you don't want to make excuses for them in a way. It's all how you spin it. If you got a, a B minus in organic chemistry at a time where something very difficult in your life was going on, you can say I may not have necessarily achieved academically the way I wanted to, but I finished and I, I, I honored my commitment in this course and I, and I was able to get through it. So, so much of how you present yourself is all how you spin it. So again, no defense, play offense, don't call attention to bad grades. And again, if you feel and you have to discuss something like this or it's important to you or your pre-med advisor tells you to do it, just be careful how you present it and present it in such a way that actually spins positive. Actually, Rona, I'm gonna jump in here because one of the, there were a couple of questions about retaking courses. Okay. So it, maybe you could just touch on that. Okay, so um, my feeling about retaking courses is if you retake a course and you don't get an A, then you look worse than you did with that grade that you're not so happy with, okay? So, because if you're taking it for the second time and you're not doing well, um, it's not good. So my recommendation is generally if to maybe take a, a higher level science course. In other words, if you didn't do so well in the basic science courses, they were tightly curved. I, th I like to see, I prefer to see you doing um, a higher level science course and performing well there and sort of showing a crescendo in your grade trajectory. Because I think that sometimes retaking a course and not doing well a second time may actually hurt you more than it helps you. Joanne, do you agree with that? I, yeah, I mean, you. I, I think it's it's a double edged. Correct. Double edged sword. Um, okay. Yeah. Other another question or. Well, there was a there was a question about AP courses, and yeah, definitely retake. Don't don't think that you don't accept them. So we, we I mean, our, our courses. I mean, our courses are recommended, but we don't accept an AP course to replace um, a a pre med requirement, so to speak. I don't. A lot of schools, I don't think, do that. If you place out in your college from that entry level bio the recommendation is still to take an upper, you know, is still yeah. to take an upper level bio course. For our students who apply, who are in our four plus four program, if they place out of the entry level bios with their AP bio, we still require them to take upper level courses in, in those disciplines. Anything else there, Joanne? Oh, there's tons. Um, okay. Why don't okay. you finish this bit? And okay, then and we'll we keep start going. The piece, we'll, we'll hit some of these questions. Okay, no problem. Okay, so here we go. Stay focused. Remember, sort of stay on point, stick to your theme, support it with examples, good, simple writing, no cliches, stay on topic. And remember, just give what is asked of you. Sometimes less is more. So stay on point again, as we said. Um, 
again, unique angle. The resilience is important. Don't overdo it. Don't be too self-congratulatory or too self-deprecating. Um, I would be careful not to overshare, especially if you have unresolved conflicts in your life, you don't need to address them in your application. I would be careful with that. That's just a helpful hint. For conflicts that you've, um, or personal challenges that you've resolved, I'm all for that, put them in. If there's stuff that's going on, that's actively going on, tread lightly there, okay? Uh, that's just a word to the wise. Um, Make sure somebody else reads your essay. Uh, Joanne and I shared this example with Joanne. We had an applicant this year whose hook, whose first sentence in their essay, who was an extraordinary applicant from a very highly uh, reputable school, very uh, strong metrics. The first line of the essay was, my life changed in March of 2019 when, when the pandemic began. Now, I hope all of you are thinking, because I thought I was going crazy <laughs> when I read it and realized that the applicant didn't have somebody proofread that and say, things shut down in 2020 and the pandemic began in 2020. So um, be careful, okay? You may look at it so many times and not pick that mistake up, but somebody who's looking at it from the outside is going to see that. And the first, that's the first thing they're going to see. So make sure you have somebody else read it. I know it's personal. I know you may not want the criticism, the judgment, whatever, but it is critical that you let somebody else see your work. And again, that proofreading, again, and even for content and something so simple as that. Um, again, uh, fatal flaws, very general, okay? Cliched writing, superficial muddled thinking going all over the place, okay? So again, self-reflection, keep your app examples. By keeping your application alive, you give, by giving examples, that's key. Uh, again, directed uh, writing, use, um, again, uh, just I'm repeating myself several times here, but make sure that the reader can follow your thought processes and that's- Rona, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question that's come up a couple times. Okay. And, um, so Matthew, if you guys could just stop entering the chat, give me one second to read this. How do we rectify the clear conflict of interest between being honest about personal hardships to explain possible academic challenges and avoiding uh, mentioning medical issues that could turn admission committees off for fear of difficulty or quote, not being able to handle med school, i.e. history of mental illness, personal loss, chronic illness. Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, but I think um, hopefully that whatever, and, and, and I agree with you there, it's a very fine line. And it often depends on who's reading on the other side. Okay, you have people who have overcome tremendous hardships who are reading your applications. Um, you have people who maybe have not had the challenges that you've had. But I think if that's why I say if you spin in such a way that you you finish, that you were able to graduate, that you even though you took time off to to sort of recenter, you know, there are ways of using language that will allow those on the other side to know that you know, uh, to see your resiliency and to see your ability to overcome these challenges in, in the process. Um, you can be vague if you don't want to put it out there directly, but understand that if you are somewhat vague about these challenges that you may have confronted and you put it in the application, you may be asked about them in the interview. Okay, whatever you put in that application potentially is fodder for uh, for an application discussion, whether you're uh, doing an MMI and there is a directed time. Uh, I, you, different schools handle this differently. Somebody who's screening your application may reach out to you and, and try and get you to give them some detail. So there are ways of handling it. Again, I say um, you probably will have an academic record post that incident that shows that you are able to, you know, deal with, manage, uh, whatever the word you want to um, use to get through those challenges. So 
if you focus on that, I think that's a way of presenting it in, uh, again, you finished, you completed, and you're able to power through it. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Joanne, you're welcome to add on if you- Yeah, no, I think, I think that most people would agree that it's, you know, it's harder to accomplish, you know, excellence in the face of challenges than it is if you if you're just you know jumping from hoop to hoop without any uh without any problem so i think you have to find that you have to find language where you can present it in a in a way that demonstrates that you, that you have you know that you've moved beyond this that it was challenging at the time that it, you've moved beyond it this is what you learned about yourself this is what you learned about society this is whatever whatever lessons you took from it and you're now ready for the next chapter of your life okay all right so um the role of the secondary here i'm going to move on and that's to give the school some more information some um some schools have several essays that are, sec are secondary. Often there's one about diversity and your understanding of social determinants of health. Some like ours talk specifically about that resiliency issue um, and understand that your secondary should not be a repetition of your common application or your AMCAS essay. It should be additional information and obviously if you can tie it in um, to the main essay and when I say connect it somehow in a theme, that's that's very helpful. Um, again, they will most for the most part be directed questions. So make sure that you are answering the question that's asked and again, potentially elaborate on elements that may have received less attention um, in your primary application. They're often shorter, so watch the word count. And, you know, don't, again, you know, there's some tricks here, but don't try to fit in more words by using smaller count. It's usually a word count, not, not the size of the font to fit into the space provided. Um, same stuff that applies to the personal essay, the theme, anecdotes and specifics without reflection will read more like a disconnected list. You don't really want to give a list. You want it to actually have some tie-in and some theme. So again, no general statements, no platitude, sort of focused answer a question, make it uh, complement the primary essay. Uh, there will be a COVID question. There will be a COVID question probably for several years to come. So make sure you prepare your COVID answer. Uh, some schools will ask, you know, how it's impacted you, the challenges. Many of you have answers to this question and some don't. And that's okay as well. You know, we understand that there's a broad range of applicants. There's a diversity of applicants and, and our, our, our question regarding this is optional. So if you don't have an answer, you don't have to make up one and put one in. Um, and be aware of the school that you're applying to. Obviously in the secondary, many schools will ask why you're interested in the particular school. So uh, don't just cut and paste stuff from the website. Don't do that because uh, we know what our websites look like. Uh, but again, try and tie it into your personal interest. If you're a neuroscience major and there's some area that you investigated and there's a neuroscientist in the institution that you have a particular interest in, obviously that's a way of tying yourself to the institution. Um, some other stuff to think about that potentially you may uh, be asked where you're going to be in 10 years, what type of practice. Understand that for the most part, um, we see students say they want to be orthopedists because they were athletes and they love their orthopedist who repaired their ACL, or they want to be pediatricians because the pediatrician diagnosed their appendicitis. It's okay to have an idea of potentially what you want to do when you get to medical school, but um, I would present it with a level of humility in the sense of saying, most likely, um, or I have an interest in X, Y, and Z, but I know there's a whole world of medicine that I have yet to encounter, and therefore, um, I'm willing and I understand and I'm willing to open my mind to other uh, possible careers uh, within medicine uh, that I'll learn about when I go to medical school. I think to 
you know, go in there and say, I want to be a cardiac surgeon because, you know, my grandpa had a cabbage and, and survived. You know, again, these are things, these uh, motivate you to learn more about a specific specialty, but understand that most of us on the other side know that generally applicants will choose what they've been exposed to as an area of interest when they're applying. So again, a level of humility in your approach is always good. Um, okay, again, clinical experiences. I know, and in the time of COVID, the clinical experience have been somewhat limited, but those of you who have had opportunities to engage in telemedicine or uh, in COVID-related um, research or cl clinical trials or anything of that nature, um, that's, that's always helpful um, in terms of um, presenting yourself. We want to know that you know what you're getting yourself into. That's the most important thing with shadowing, with any kind of clinical experience that you have. Um, medical school admissions wants to know that you have some concept of what practicing medicine is all about. Okay, I'm, go, I'm trying to go forward here, sorry. As I said, my laptop's a little bit. Uh, okay, a little bit about the thank yous. Um, Thank you notes are not necessary, but everybody sends them. Um, make sure you address them to the persons that you interviewed with. Send them within 24 hours. Try to refer to something in the interview um, experience, um, in your interview discussion. Make it as personal as possible. Uh, letters of intent, again, uh, letters of intent are relevant. They tend to be more important when the late wait list becomes active. Uh, if you send a letter of intent now, uh, schools will say, oh, that's nice, but they know that you can hold multiple acceptances until the April 30th deadline. So um, again, you can send a letter of intent, but April 30th, when it's one spot, one school, and the wait lists become active is really where they become critical. Um, if it is your top choice, you say, I will go if I'm accepted, uh, I would only send that to one school because if you send it to more than one and the school accepts you and then you end up not coming, uh, schools have uh, ability of um, understanding that and communicating, although they don't communicate during the process, but it won't stand you in good stead. Um, and if you've gotten into another school and are still interested in the school that you're sending the letter to, it's helpful to share that as well. So as specific as you can be is always helpful in those. Okay, so again, this is what you focus on when you're applying. Obviously, different people weight these things differently. Different schools weight them differently. There isn't one formula, but make sure that whatever you're doing to support your application, passion is the most important. If you are very focused on community service, you know, make sure you can demonstrate that in your leadership, in whatever uh, it is. If you've had an illness and you've over, and I put illness in the medically related experiences, again, what you've learned from your own illness or that family illness that has motivated or, you know, what you want to improve on medicine, given your experiences, all those things are, are really helpful in presenting yourself when, when you're applying. Okay, and again, here uh, a bunch of references that uh, are available to you. Stuff about the secondary, the AAMC has a lot of material, student doctor, there's a website call, called accepted.com, which also gives you a lot of good and relevant information. Um, and as I mentioned to you, that all access admissions podcast is, is very, very good as well. Now, uh, I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Joanne and, um, Joanne, yeah, either gonna, you want to just yeah. next screen it or you want to take the screen back? We can do next screen. I just, I mean, if you can just advance for me. I just realized that I've been answering, but I did, wasn't answering to everybody. I was just answering to the other panelists. So how stupid am I? But there was actually a couple of good okay, questions you, I thought. Sure, sure. Let's just answer. Quickly talk about. One of them, a couple of students asked about community, having, having gone to community college and is that a is that is that going to impact their their chances and also state schools? I would say state schools no. Community <laughs> um, colleges. Um, oh. So we understand uh, the role of community college in um, 
especially because of cost. Community colleges are cheaper. And um, we have students who uh, attend community college and then transfer uh, to major universities. Again, that's all fine and good grades from there are all fine. Understand though, it may put a little bit more pressure on your MCAT because they tend to be not as competitive uh, in certain circumstances. So, you know, when that, that would be my only um, thought about it. We do accept, um, we do accept coursework from community colleges and as do schools once you transfer. Uh, but again, it may put a little bit more pressure on that MCAT just because of the environment in which you're taking, in which you're taking those courses. Other questions there, Joanne? Uh, um, so non-traditional students um, and post back programs. Oh, uh, I think we do have a we do have our post back slide. So I think that's toward the end. Did I not? Um, okay. I, I we do have that. So um, I'm Joanne will I think get over get up to this. So we'll show okay. you. All but right. so let's uh, launch this. Then. Okay. Let's launch forward, and then we can always okay. answer at the back side. So I'm going to present very quickly. If you go to the next slide, Rona. Okay. I'm sure. going to present very quickly what our first two years of what the first two years of medical school look like at ah, the Zucker. I'm going program. the wrong way. Sorry, wrong. Sorry. It's okay. Um, and uh, I'm going to start this by saying that our charge in developing our medical curriculum, medical school curriculum, was to our charge from the dean was to reinvent medical school. So unlike what you might see at more traditional schools, um, our students take one course at a time and each course has uh, different components. The idea behind the courses, so each, so what's shown here is uh, this, oh, you can't see my, so from, the, from the, the red through the blue is the first year and from the purple through the, uh, to the end is the second year. Um, and the idea behind the, the courses is that we're building a human. Um, the very first course, however, is sort of an overview course to sort of get your, your bearings. It's an overview of human physiology and principles of pharmacology. And during that course, you also get your EMT license. Um, so all our students learn about the healthcare system through the eyes of being a member on a team, an EMT team. And it also sort of gives them the bona fides so that when they go on to doing their initial clinical, clinical experience in first and second year, they actually have some skills. So um, the, the, the way the courses are outlined is they build a human. So we start with the biological imperative, which is basically cells and molecules. We go on to fueling the body, which is biochemistry and GI physiology and pathophysiology. We go on, then, then we go into uh, continuity and change of homeostasis. So that's heart, lungs, and renal. Uh, we have the summer during which most of our students uh, stay in the health system and receive a small stipend to do research. Um, the beginning of the second year starts with immunology. That's the interacting with the environment course, then on to the host microbe uh, inter uh, interactions. So that's the microbiology and infectious disease course that I actually am the um, course director for. And then uh, after the winter break, we come back and students finish up with the human condition, which is uh, neurology and psychiatry. Students have six weeks to study for step one. Um, and then they have a transition course, which basically gets them ready for, um, uh, for their clinical experiences. So each course has a basic science component. It has a, uh, what we call a structure component, which integrates anatomy, embryology, pathology, histology, and medical imaging. And then a doctoring course, which is called patient physicians in society. So that's everything from ethics to, uh, to population health. Go to the next slide. I'm okay, try and Joanne, do this quickly just because were, I want to leave yeah. room for, for um, questions. Yeah, for questions. They're just the, the EMT question. Um, even if you are an EMT, uh, we yeah, have this question can. all the time. Um, yeah. We and Joe, Joe, Dr. Willie can explain a little bit about how um, 
we sort of give you an EMT course, but we call it EMT accelerated or on steroids um, in that you're going to be doing our curriculum on top of the New York State EMT curriculum. Um, and so you're going to be learning and uh, Dr. Willie can detail um, at a much different level. So our students who are EMTs, they do retake it, but often they serve as facilitators in the basic EMT part of the curriculum when they're when um, they're doing that portion. So go so, for it. So, so if you already are in an emergency medical technician, you'll be familiar with the skills piece, but um, the basic science and the pathophysiology piece will be uh, given to you at a much deeper level. Um, in preparation, basically everything that you get during that first course, you will revisit. Um, the, uh, the, every week has sort of a similar structure whereby you spend six hours a week in small groups doing uh, case-based learning. Um, that's, Pearl, uh, that's called PEARLS, which is a very long acronym that nobody can remember. Um, there's usually four hours of basic science instruction um, two hours of patient, physician, and society, and then you have an entire morning of structure. And structure is not, it's not your father or mother's anatomy lab. It's taught in small groups, again, case space uh, in, in um, stations where students move from one basic, basically one problem that may or may not have a body or a prosection uh, associated with it uh, to, to another problem um, or another station that presents another problem. So the idea is that students come to class already prepared and uh, we want you to sort of apply the knowledge that you've prepared to new and um, uh, sort of relevant situations. So go to the next slide. I'm, I'm typing answers as you're I talking. know, it's really- so, I know, we're, we're multitasking here, but we're good. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the third and fourth year um, look very much like other schools. Uh, different schools do it different ways, but essentially uh, the entire class is broken into th three parts and each part is then broken into half. So you have about 16 or 17 students in your cohort and you do pairs of clinical experiences. So in the third year, you're doing neurology and psychiatry. Then in, in this in this student would be doing like neurology and psychology, psychiatry. Then they have a, a, a two week selective where they can do whatever they, they can uh, pick a discipline that they want to um, to observe and participate in. Then they have their their uh, exams. Then they come back and do OBGYN and p pediatrics followed with another selective and then medicine and surgery with, uh, with another uh, period of, of exams. And then the fourth year, I don't, do we have a slide for the fourth yeah, year? Of course we do. Of the fourth we do. year is largely, uh, so, so there's been an interesting sort of phenomenon in, in medical school where some, year, some schools are just cutting out the fourth year entirely. Other schools are uh, sort of embracing that fourth year. So we have, um, we have several uh, required acting internships as well as electives, um, but you are required to do an acting internship in critical care, in medicine, sur in, in family medicine, pediatrics, um, medicine or surgery, so your, your choice, and also in emergency medicine. So uh, some of these electives, uh, and then professional development, the purple stripes for professional development are essentially for uh, time spent for interviewing. So um, I see somebody's interested in forensic pathology. So you could do a two week selective in, in pathology or you could do, uh, an, uh, you could do a, a basically design an elective in pathology. So fourth year is really a time when you get to do as much career exploration as possible. Um, okay. that, uh, yeah, yeah, Joanne, there are a couple of questions about research. Uh, you know, does it have to be medicine? It, can it be plant biology or something else? My, my feeling is, and, and maybe you can respond. For, for application well. wise? Yeah, for yeah. application. So it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. I think it's more that you've engaged in the process of doing yeah. research. So you understand how to generate a hypothesis, how you go about proving it, et cetera, et cetera. It's more uh, an understanding of the process than it is, I think, in many, many times, the actual content. Um, I just, I see a thing about publication. Publications are nice, but they're certainly not necessary. Um, 
uh, what was it, low income, first gen, first the cost gen. of MCAT prep and, and application. So that's um, an interesting question, but that's um, one that I think the AAMC and um, some of the sites that um, I've I pointed out to you that all access admission, um, the AAMC has put out a lot of MCAT prep material uh, that is available to you. So um, I would, you know, strongly suggest using those materials. They are, they are good. They are very, very good. Um, so yeah, let's go forward and see what else we have. I think there's a lot of questions about applications. So I don't know how much we want to. Okay. We only have a few minutes left. Okay, we can go. Um, you know, we were talking here a little bit about the pandemic and students ask about things that they can do uh, uh, since a lot of their shadowing experience and, and whatever are gone. There are a lot of things that are COVID related that have opened opportunities for you to participate. Working with the elderly, working with school age children, working in food banks, all of those things are, are ways. And we've seen applicants who have really used being contact tracers. All many of our applicants have actually used COVID as an opportunity to pivot in, I hate that word because everybody uses it, but to pivot into different types of activities. But um, again, uh, very much um, uh, open and um, important in terms of developing your application. Um, other things, and this was the post -back. So there are a bunch of post -back programs. Uh, there are those that are career changers, and then there are those that are more booster programs. Here is a list. The Princeton website actually has a, uh, and take a look at this or take a picture of it if you're interested in post -back. They have a very uh, good, robust list that can help you um, in terms of um, uh, pointing you in the direction of the post -back programs. So other suggestions for non-traditional students, I would say run with it. Like, yeah, uh, like, you know what? There's no such thing as a traditional student anymore. No. I mean, uh, Joanne will tell you, we've had students in our school who have been human rights lawyers before they went to medical school. We have students who have been professional athletes. One of our students who just graduated this past year has a World Series ring. He played baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, there's no such thing as a, and, and we have those who majored in chemistry and applied straight out of college. So, you know, there's no such thing as a traditional student anymore. And so, don't feel the need to distinguish yourself in that way. What's important to do is if you're a dancer or if you were a professional dancer, um, why do you want to be a doctor? That, yeah, that, that's the question you have to answer. That's, yeah. So I think there was somebody who was saying they taught preschool or, you know, so I, I, I don't teaching think that's- is, Teaching is teaching critical. Exactly. Critical. I think that you can use that totally to your, your advantage. And and somebody was 30 and made it sound like that that all the doors had closed. And no, no, not at all. I mean, we've had applicants in their 40s, or not even out, we've had matriculants in their 40s. So um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of, of being able to explain why you want to be a physician, how your lived experience has informed your decisions. Um, I think that's the, the most critical part. Um, okay, I saw somebody say they were a flight attendant go by here. So yeah, it's cool. Tell us why being a flight attendant and how you were led to medicine. That's good. There was a question that I see go by. There are so many, and I apologize about that, um, uh, about not being able to even get to a, a good percentage of them. Um, there was a question, I'm sorry, about pass fail. We, we ex, you know, most schools are aware that in the COVID environment, some of, uh, some of the uh, colleges and universities are only you, allowing you to take the courses pass fail. So we understand that though that's not going to hurt you. You do not necessarily have to retake those courses. Um, understand if we don't, we don't. Um, require it, but if you are given the option of taking the class for a grade, we will look at that critically. You know, if you've, even though given the option to do pass fail, you are um, motivated and you do take it with a grade, uh, given the fact that you have the right computer environment to support taking that class that way, you know, we will look at that um, and, and, and basically in a, in a somewhat favorable manner. Somebody wrote something about high school. I would not 
stay away from including high school experiences on your application. The assumption on the admission side is that you have enough of uh, experiences in college. The only way the um, high school should be brought in is let's say you've been ice skating six, you're six years old and you competed and now you're you know, a figure skater for your college. You can make a reference to that if you've been, again, the music that's continuous and all the way through, but to talk about high school experiences that ended in high school that you have not carried through um, into college and beyond, I would not discuss them to fill space. You know, the, again, the assumption is high school's high school and you're done with that. And now, you know, where are you now as an applicant? There's a bunch of questions about virtual shadowing. I don't know if you want to talk about shadowing. In, in yeah, so we're not a big shadow school. Do yeah. Our dean, Dr. Smith, says shadowing for one day is enough. Um, we're all about doing. I, When applicants ask about it, I tend to point them more towards scribing. I think scribing is a more active process, and in that you can learn what it's like to be in a physician. There are ways of being a scribe in, teleme in a telemedicine environment. So, um, you know, Virtually watching somebody is even, I think, less active than watching them in person when you're looking over their shoulder. So we're not a big shadow school. Uh, so I, I, I don't really. Um, and Dr. Willie, who sits on our admissions committee, she can she can speak to that as well. We like to see active engagement. Yeah, yeah. Scrubs. Scribing is much better, much better. EKG tech, we've had, you know, we had somebody, uh, one of our best students turned out, uh, she was an ultrasound technician before she came to medical school. So yeah, pharmacy we like- Pharmacy techs, people who work in pharmacy, pharmacy techs, you can get some very good experiences working in- and all of those, anybody, because you really, we understand you really know what you're getting into. If you have those experiences and you still want to come to medical school, <laughs> That's a great thing. You I know? saw the CNA go by. That's a really good, again, all of these things are good yeah. experiences. It, uh, it shows that you understand or you have some engagement in what, in what patient care is all about and some knowledge. I think people who are CNAs, I think that's incredibly, um, it, it, it is a good activity and can significantly strengthen your application in terms of your knowledge of what it is to be a caretaker. Phlebotomy I saw go by, again, you have to interact with the patient. You have to t deal with them when they're in a vulnerable circumstance. That's, that's what we're after. Do you, do you understand what that is? Do you, can you be empathetic to somebody who's about to faint because you're going to stick a needle in their arm? You know, that, that, that's, we want to know that potentially you have had an encounter like that and, and have walked your way through it. Yeah, I think, I think, I think we're probably out of time. I see. Yeah, you guys are right on the, on the dot here. Um, I have to, I have to give you guys a huge thank you. Um, I appreciate your candor in this conversation. I think for anyone who missed out on this conversation, they missed an extremely valuable lecture. Um, absolutely fantastic insights uh, for a, you know, a population of, of participants that I think really value this kind of information. Um, and I think it's also important for them to hear that none of it's that shocking. <laughs> it's kind of you know do good work and demonstrate you did go, good work without showing an ego and that you're willing to continue to do good work. And so I think it just validates kind of what, what we heard all along. So. Thank um, you so much, guys. Can I can I share one thing to, um, before we close? Because I learn Please. a lot. I I learn a lot when reading applications. I learn so much from the applicants. And one of the best things that I learned, um, and I ask you all to take this with you, about the difference between arrogance and confidence. Um, arrogance is only I can do this, and confidence is. I can do this, right? That's the difference. So be confident, don't be arrogant, okay? And um, if you're confident, people want to see that you're confident, that you're confident in your skills, that you're confident in your ability to accomplish your goals. Uh, but at the same time, be humble in the process. You're not the only person who's doing this. There are many others like you who will do it and will do it well. And your goal should be to want to work with those people, right? Like yourself, who are going to be on your team and trying to deliver the best healthcare possible. 
before we go, uh, that was wonderful, guys. Thank you. Randy, I asked Flora to uh, show our Thanksgiving video to the, to the group here. I, Flora did a great job. You might want to watch this. It's pretty good, Joanne and Rona. Um, for Thanksgiving, she put together, this is a patient of Dr. Ortiz's and Dr. Uh, Ellis. And uh, we can end on that. But if there's anything that Joshua or Joanne or Rona or Rafa or any of you guys wanted to say before we turn it over to Flora, and then we'll exit with this uh, as a uh, salute to 2020. <laughs> I think that's all we need left over is a, a goodbye to this. Yeah. But uh, I will say that we're going to be back in the summertime. So stay tuned. Obviously, check spring. the Rancher's website. No, we're going to do a spring one. We'll do a full spring. day of spring. Spring a spring break. event. I was going to surprise them, but all right, fine. <laughs> Act surprised. And then we'll be back in the summer. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, that was very inspiring. I think I'm going to apply to med school now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to stop sharing your screen. That. That's okay. And I'm just going to play this short video and flora is recovering from covid by the way so uh, <laughs> thanks for being here flora of course this has been a great day uh, definitely a a good change for my netflix watching <laughs> can everyone see my screen yes yes I've been written about Thanksgiving since elementary years, but with how my life has taken a turn, it feels necessary that I do so this year. We all go through the trial and tribulations of what we call life. Some of us survive them while others give up the fight. Some grateful just to be alive while others obsess, stress, and or resent what's not in their lives. I am now one of those thankful to just be alive. Thankful for the doctors who saved my life, dedicated themselves and their time despite risking contracting a virus that has already taken so many lives. Thankful for the nurses who took care of me on those long nights, treating me as though they saw their own son whenever they looked into my eyes. Thankful for the EMTs on that one scary night who saw the worry and concern on my face and reassured me that everything would be just fine. Thankful for the family members that stayed by my side even though my hospital room was empty, it felt like they were right there on my bedside. Thankful for the mentors who have always seen me as their own child, providing me with advice that I cannot find with just my own insights. Always helping me to see the bigger picture and remind me that in the long run, things would be all right. Thankful for the friends who never left me behind, who've always treated me like a brother since the day I entered their lives. The ones who felt the pain of my mother when the news hit the light and made sure that it was not only me who was doing all right. Thankful for those in which my bonds are not tight, those who I have become distant from but reappeared at just the right time. Those that reached out even if our only interactions were on one or two nights. Most of all, I'm thankful for everyone who saw the light in me despite the darkness that had blinded my sight. Everyone who loves me and believed that someday I'd be back to myself and that I would shine. Those that prayed for me and took a special interest to make sure that I was always doing all right. And it is because of you all that I now appreciate and am thankful for my own precious life. Thanks, Thanks, Flo. Randy, you want to, Joshua, if you want to finish up, Rafa? All good. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, yeah, for joining. It's a powerful video. That's why we do this. So, all right, guys. Till next time. Yeah. Have a great night. Thanks so much, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us again. Having us again.